Um, I say continue. Do I have to do that on the other one? Uh, I don't know. We can see the other one. I think it's fine. We can see the other one. So, right. I can just about hit. I, I was able to hit the continue button. Okay. Uh, right. So it's my great pleasure to uh, present Honor McBride today, who is going to talk about Epigram Two. Um, so this is a. Uh, in the series, we've seen mostly uh, new, uh, uh, new proof assistants, experimental proof assistants. Connor is going to tell us something about uh, a proof assistant that seems to be on a tombstone. Um, yes. Connor? Yeah. Uh, in, in the midst of life, uh, we are in death. Um, please gather to remember. Uh, a lost proof assistant that was never actually found in the first place. Uh, it's extremely weird for me to be presenting from uh, my, you uh, know, on a beautiful sunny Glasgow day. You don't get very many of them, except during a pandemic. Uh, in uh, in my study, uh, which is basically an emotional death trap, uh, full of uh, relics of people who are no longer with us, and um, you know, it, it's uh, you know, just sort of frightening the things that spook me when I trip over them, literally, in this room. Uh, but it's where my whiteboard is. Um, so uh, I guess I'm going to switch on my screen sharing now to present the the plan. Um, so, uh, so this uh, 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 this is uh, what's what's going to happen. I, I guess I'll be talking to the laptop for a bit. Um, that's uh, that's the overview uh, of the talk. I, I I think I have a a plan. Uh, and what what kind of funeral? What what better way to start uh, a funeral with? Uh, the, the reanimation than with the reanimation of the deceased. Um, I guess I should just check how people are doing with font size. Is that legible? And I'm going to type meta x open page. larger, please. Sure. And I'll need to do that here. Okay. Uh, I might need to do some rearrangement on the fly. I think this will be all right, but we, I could be wrong. I'm always nervous about this sort of stuff. Right. So I can feed in the type of natural numbers and now I can start uh, implementing addition. So what happens here? Um, you can see that I've got a funny looking goal. I'm not being asked to, um, to deliver a natural number. I've got a natural number called M and a natural number called N. And my goal says that we are programming and that I'm supposed to deliver not just any old natural number, but the natural number whose job is to be plus M N. So this is actually an old McKenna McBride trick from epigram one, where you use a gratuitous phantom type to make a goal look like the left hand side of a functional program. So now when I refine by uh, nat induction on M, I get the first of my sub goals, which looks like uh, the uh, the left hand side uh, of the first case. Uh, I can then solve that problem, and I get the second case. And you see some hilarious artifacts now for the new sub goal, um, where uh, uh, yeah, I, I've got the the goal is the left hand side for the other case. Um, I'm going to see if I can 
move that window to somewhere more helpful. Um, so I've got to be careful with the cursor. Uh, yeah, so you can see lots of these funny uh, variables with, with hats. Um, the, um, the epigram two position was always that um, uh, it's not worth inventing fresh names for things. Uh, you know, every name is uh, it's just a, its own space of de Brown indices. Um, but I can nonetheless, crucially, maybe I'll depart from the script because that's always fun. Um, I can say, oh, I'm going to fill in the right hand side. Uh, so what's just happened is that uh, I did a refined tactic, but I left a hole uh, in the uh, in the term. Uh, so now I should be able to say, give uh, suck something, and then I should be able to say, give plus k n, and hopefully we're done. Uh, so I can go back out to the root. Oh, that's what the next thing is anyway. And let's see what happens. Right, we actually managed to add two and two and, uh, and get four. So that's, that's reassuring. Um, uh, so what's really happening there, crucial takeaway is that uh, it's just a boring ordinary theorem prover that uh, you can give commands to, but we carefully use types to characterize not just which semantic objects represent the solutions of the problem, but how the problem ought to be presented as well, right? The slogan is types are for presentation as well as representation. So here we presented uh, the, the problem of writing a function whose type is nat to nat to nat as a programming problem. And then essentially just being able to deploy induction principles gave us the kind of uh, you know, interactive case splitting experience uh, cheaply. Uh, okay, let's, um, let's prove some theorems just so that I can at least uh, justify the claim that it is a proof assistant and indeed, uh, this proof is very much assisted uh, because one of the, the joyful things about having honest to goodness definitional proof irrelevance is that you really don't care which proof you end up with, so you can just go wild when you search for them. It doesn't really, there's no wrong answer. Um, uh, so uh, I was, yeah, so the transitivity, I didn't even have to do any work. To, uh, to get that. And now what's going to happen? I'm going to prove that adding zero on the right is, uh, is boring. And that again is going to be, well, one case just disappears. I only get a successful case. Uh, and and uh, the uh, step case is easily dismissed. Right. Again, it's doing some, some proof search. Uh, not as much as I'd like, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, there's 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 no hassle about you know picking intention you know what is intentionally the wrong proof when proofs are irrelevant. They're doing the usual successor on the right because you can tell what am I going to do? I'm about to prove uh, that plus is commutative. Can I stop you there for a sec? Sure. Um, we seem to have two choices, and I wonder if we can fix this regarding the presentation. Uh -huh. We can have good audio watching your back, uh, or we can have bad audio watching your front. Which, which, which of the two computers is picking up the audio? Uh, my phone should not be sending any audio. OK, because, um, yes. So, okay, if I spotlight your desktop, 
then let's see then it seems like the your your audio goes bad say something um does how about this this is better okay let's stay with this yeah I, so i think the audio on my phone is muted but uh these things behave strangely sometimes okay okay seems fine now uh okay uh, so yeah i'm going to pr prove that plus is commutative and it's completely done in the standard way so you know induction base case step case which is a combination of uh the law we just proved and the induction hypothesis and then the point is that of course i define what it is to flip a function and then i want to prove that the function flip plus is equal to the function plus and what do i do i simplify that goal and you can see it turns into uh, a, a, a statement of extensional equality uh, now, that, now several people are saying they would appreciate a slightly smaller font okay uh so i can do that and that it's a bit of a problem to see both things at both screens. Yeah, you have to make you make to make you have to make happy everyone on one side and phil waddler on the other so you have to have good balance there right uh, this is fine but, as it is thank you right uh so here i'm not uh i'm proving that flip plus is plus by proving that they both take equal inputs to equal outputs uh, so that when I grab my whoops, just what happened there? It's my cursor was in the wrong place. Um, uh, oh dear, something went wrong there. Um, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit say root. I'm going to give up on that. I'm going to start again. Let me simplify that and I get the extensional version, introduce all the assumptions, eliminate the equation, and then it turns into an appeal to commutativity of plus. So uh, what have we seen? We have seen that uh, we have construction by refinement, we have um, kind of interactive case splitting done on the cheap by careful use of phantom types. And we have uh, function extensionality. Uh, so there you go. That was a thing that, uh, that you know, really did exist in, uh, in October 2010. Uh, and we used to have, well, the problem was, uh, Far too much fun. Uh, so, okay, what I want to do now is uh, uh, switch to my board and and tell you a bit more about the structure of the thing. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share at this stage. All right. So, eraser. Let's get rid of this ludicrous cartoon. Although I want the, uh, the the green shoots at the bottom were important because you know what I would like to achieve is that the deceased does manage to push up some daisies. I really like there to be some some fresh growth as a result of uh, of some old ideas. I mean that's that's really why I can be bothered to tell you about it, apart from just you know Twitter bravado. And, and other such nonsense. So what's the structure of the thing? Uh, well, basically, first, you build a type checker. And then uh, on top of your type checker, you build a thing called the proof state. And what is that? Um, that's uh, a thing where you add uh, meta variables and you add 
modules. So you end up, so what is a metavariable? Uh, well, in my religion, uh, a metavariable is exactly uh, a definition which does not yet have a definiens, right? It's a, it's a marker that you're going to make a definition, uh, but, it's, uh, but you haven't actually done it yet. So what you have are parameterized modules and, um, uh, and metavariables. And in the course of making a definition, uh, you might introduce a local module of auxiliary stuff. So you end up with a tree structure of incomplete constructions. But although they're incomplete, you can still type check them because meta variables have types and you can make sure that everything is okay so far, right? The crucial invariant that you maintain is that everything is well typed, even if it's not finished. And one nice thing you can do in this setting is to, if, if things don't quite type check yet, you can certainly use equality evidence to fix their types up uh, and then hope that computes away when you solve the equations. Okay, so more just gonna stay at high level. The next thing you need is two-way communication with human beings. Uh, and with the sort of surface language syntax. So there's uh, two processes. One is called elaboration and the other we called distillation, uh, where um, uh, the elaboration takes the surface syntax and turns it into the uh, construction in the core type theory. Uh, where, and distillation uh, does the opposite. Distillation finds the tasty for humans good stuff in ghastly proof terms and, uh, uh, and presents something more human friendly. And then the plan was to, um, to build a programming language on top of that. So more or less, the idea is uh, that uh, you can read a, a lump of source code as instructions for systematically doing a construction in the proof state. And uh, that never happened, uh, but uh, because we wanted to be able to do stuff and play around, uh, we built that command-driven interactive environment, which, because we're bastards, we called cochon. Um, it's, um, um, which of course is, uh, it, it is not only pig, but also a bit shit, um, is the, the sense we were, we're trying to, to go for there. Connor, may I ask you something? Um, yeah. here, the distillation, is that supposed to be the same language that gets elaborated? Is that something that you expect to be able to repass or to reprocess in some way? Uh, yeah, well, yes, yeah, so we would expect that distillation should produce something that would re-elaborate. It's actually quite hard to guarantee that, but uh, you can get quite close. The crucial thing about these things is that they are type directed. So I'm not talking about uh, syntactic sugar. Um, I'm talking about stuff like, well, maybe the core type, th indeed, the core type theory does represent elements of enumerations as numbers. And yet, if you know the, what the enumeration type is, specified by a list of tags, you can distill that low-level number using the type information to say which tag was being encoded by that number. 
So there's genuine sort of type directed encoding and decoding going on in, in this layer. Uh, and I haven't quite drawn the full picture because all of this layer of technology was built on top of, well, that's the whole point. It was all written in Haskell. But not as we know it. Uh, it was written in the local dialect of Haskell that I was developing in about 2009 uh, with you, the, uh, under the name, the, the Strathclyde Haskell Enhancement. And uh, so correspondingly, in order to fight bit rot and compile that code to run that demo, I not only had to fix epigram 2, I also had to fix G. And uh, so let me, um, let me speak up for kamikaze bastards who decide that they can't stand any of the programming languages they've been handed in order to build their proof assistant. So the first move is to build the programming language in which they're going to build the proof assistant. This is a wonderful thing to do. I mean, it's a terrible idea from an engineering point of view, but from uh, but it, it's just it's just a you know sheer pleasure to build the tools that that you want. Actually, um, uh, let me see. Uh, you know, my my old man. Uh, this uh, this is my old man. Um, uh, he uh, uh, his slogan was. Uh, whenever you want to solve a problem, think what programming you'd language you'd like to solve that problem in. Implement that programming language, and then solve that problem, and all the other problems like it. Uh, so, uh, you know, very much doing that, uh, I uh, uh, I rather tinkered with what Haskell could do uh, in order to implement this stuff. Uh, by the way. Uh, I'm completely with Andre that uh, effects and handlers are wonderful tools to have at your disposal when you're writing a proof assistant. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my, uh, my next proof assistant is going to have a lot of fun with those. Um, right. So let me just briefly summarize things that, uh, that she supplies. Uh, well, you get um, dependent types. Uh, and uh, you get um, pattern synonyms. Uh, and those things have comprehensively been uplifted by the Glasgow Haskell compiler. So this piece of, of you know, Tom Foolery uh, has, has gone somewhere. And then there are some things which, um, which didn't happen, like, uh, uh, default superclass instances. Right, because what happens is, uh, I mean, what I had to spend several days doing was everywhere I used to have a monoid instance, I got, ah, hang on a minute, you can't have a monoid unless you also have a semi-group. And the whole point of default superclass instances is that you can say, well, if there's, <laughs> If there's nothing else going on, uh, every monoid gives rise to a semigroup in this way, and uh, code doesn't break when the library gets better. Uh, but uh, uh, so it's ironic uh, that the code I had to fix was the code that gives me the automatic fix. That that really irritated me immensely. Um, and the other thing, which is absolutely suicidal, is an approach to aspect-oriented programming, which is based on uh, total uh, chewing gum and string. I think I might uh, share a screen just to do a bit of wandering about in the source code if that's okay. So I'll go back to my desktop, but 
Instead, I'm gonna grab my preview window. So we really pretended to take seriously the idea of, of literate programming. And all of this stuff is written in uh, literate Haskell. And I'm really glad that we did, not least because uh, the early chapters of, so this, this is the, the, the source code turned into a massive PDF. I think, it, yes, nearly 300 pages long. Um, and, uh, and these are all the people who ever touched the code base. Um, and um, some, it's really useful to have a clickable table of contents. Um, and let me see, it's always good to go straight for the term syntax. Um, so you get things like this. Uh, this was what dependent types in Haskell looked like uh, in, uh, in 2009. We declare some data types and we declare some other, uh, and then we declare the type of terms depending on those things. Uh, so every, so that the, uh, the type of terms is uh, indexed over a direction because we do um, bi-directional type checking. Ha ha, this is the bi now, this is Pierre writing. The, the bi now, bi, traditional bi-directional type checking. It's only traditional in my shop. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so we have um, uh, uh, in terms where the types go in and X terms where the types come out. I don't know why we did that in Latin. Uh, and we also had a sort of phase distinction. Uh, we had an old fashioned evaluator and we have a phase distinction between the things that we think of as terms and the things that we think of as values. And then there's uh, a bunch of constructors that definitely have to be there. And uh, a whole bunch of other things. And then where is, where is the thing that I'm looking for? Ah, uh, yeah. And then you get declarations like this. So I've, I always um, uh, hive off the canonical uh, constructors into a separate function uh, parameterized by their notion of subterm. So I say, well, you know, here are the canonical things that we know we're definitely going to have. And then there's this weird thing um, which is not Haskell, uh, but exploits the fact that import is a keyword in Haskell. Uh, and that says, uh, we're going to get the rest of this data type from a whole bunch of bits and pieces distributed all over the rest of the code base. And we're going to scoop them all up and plonk them here. And what that means is, for example, that if I go to, let's say, this thing, uh, this is the file which implements sigma types, and that consists of sending a bunch of stuff to a bunch of different parts of the code base. So here is where I add more constructors to the, the, the big data type of canonical constructors, but I don't have to think of them all at once. I can implement uh, the sigma type feature of the system in one file and say what has to be added to each different sort of definition. So you can see I'm you know, adding stuff to the pretty printer and uh, a bunch of, of, of other things, you know, adding stuff to the traversable implementation and goodness knows uh, what else. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it was it was really nice from the point of view of kind of cognitive load to be able to do that 
but it is a complete and utter disaster for the build system. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, you know, GHC minus minus make won't cut it. The make file is horrendously complicated. Uh, oh, there's one other thing that she gives you, which I'm not sure I've got time to show, but uh, inevitably, well, okay, it's not inevitable that one uses the brown indices, but I do. Um, however, uh, when in the source code of your proof assistant, you want to write terms that in a representation that uses the brown indices, it's nonetheless nice for human beings writing code to use names. So for goodness sake, get your handy language preprocessor to do the conversion from names to the brown indices for you, right? Um, the brown indices are great for machines. They're horrible for people. Uh, you know, do that deal sensitively. Uh, you know, there's sort of these little modern conveniences that it's great to have when you're, uh, um, when you're building a proof assistant, you know, don't go without, build them yourself, write a preprocessor. And, uh, you know, okay, you kind of customize yourself to death, but uh, it's, uh, it's fun to, to think through uh, just, you know, which things you can make easier for yourself with a little bit of coding. Okay, I kind of ought to go back to the board now, having talked about weird Haskell for a bit, and I'll stop sharing the screen and talk about what's in the type theory. Um, uh, so uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, I should explain that that facility was done uh, literally with the, I mean, the computational equivalent of, uh, uh, of scissors and sticky tape. You know, it really was just literally pasting text. Um, it, it dealt with indentation, but that's pretty much all. So there's no separate compilation. Uh, there's no sort of separate static checking of any of those fragments. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the point. I guess my point is that. Uh, you can do a hell of a lot in terms of aspect-oriented programming without actually solving the expression problem in your dynamic semantics, right? You know, um, it's, uh, if, you can, if your compiler can rearrange the aspects, then that's plenty. You don't have to solve this problem at runtime unless you really have some other motivation for doing it. Uh, okay. So I want to talk about what's in the type theory. And I've already said it's uh, bidirectional, uh, which is it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, it's, it's in the, the, the great spirit of computer scientists doing mathematics rather than uh, Mathematicians doing mathematics, where uh, uh, you know proofs go backwards. Uh, <laughs> you actually, you actually look at what you're trying to prove, <laughs> and make a move that makes sense in the, in the context of what you're trying to do. You know, rather than just saying, you know, oh, here's a proof. I wonder what it's a proof of. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, as a complete apropos of nothing, I'm taking over first year logic next year, and for the first time ever at Strathclyde, natural deduction will go backwards. And uh, you know, I'm you know, fed up with inheriting people who have been taught to do natural deduction forwards. It's terrifying. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, what happens next? So it's bidirectional. Uh, what else is there to say about it? It's um, intentional, i.e., it's safe to run programs, safe to run open programs, uh, 
uh, I mean, up to type and type, which is not a design choice. It's, uh, it's a temporary hack, type and type. It's a great temporary hack. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's one of those things, you know, uh, universes in type theory, uh, there are various ways of dealing with them. I decided that I wanted to think about it before I implemented it. So I just implemented the easiest way to avoid the problem in the time being. Um, but the point is that it should be possible in my book to compute with open terms. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, the thing I love about intentional type theory is that it divides labor along the lines of the judgment forms. You know, it is human effort to demonstrate the inhabitation of a type. But it is machine effort to check the outcome of running a program so that the equality judgment is how you give work to the machine. And then you get all of this uh, you know, reflection machinery. What is, what is proof by reflection in that setting? It is exactly explaining why a piece of work is no longer human work. It's, uh, it's machine work. It's the explanation of how the equality judgment can just take care of it. And uh, so there's a real sense of, you know, why keep a dog and bark yourself? Um, but it's also extensional, as you saw in the propositional equality. Moreover, it's proof irrelevant uh, for the definitional equality. So, unlike in Koch, um, proofs of propositions really are irrelevant. The definitional equality considers them to be, to be equal. Um, and of course, this has some consequences. Uh, it, it means that uh, if you want to decide, when you're deciding what does equality of types mean, then you can't do anything univalent. You can't say uh, that equality of types is up to isomorphism or something. There really have to be, you can't make something proof irrelevant and then put bits in it, right? Uh, there really has to be, you really have to make, if, if you're gonna use this approach, you have to make sure that uh, there's at most one way in which things can possibly be equal. In effect, that equality is a sort of structural thing. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's why, uh, you know, Torsten went off uh, observational type theory up to a point. And I think that's, that's quite sensible, actually. Uh, I don't think that this notion of equality is uh, the end of the uh, equality story, but there were situations where it was perfectly adequate for what was needed, and it was nice to get uh, proof of relevance. It saved an awful lot of tedious bureaucracy. So I think it might be nice to think about how to recover this. Uh, okay, um, I need to figure out uh, how to, uh, I, I, I was gonna do a pile of typing rules, but I see that time is marching on. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll tell you uh, a bit more of the story. Okay, one thing I did want to say uh, about uh, bidirectional typing is that it fits really nicely with proof of relevance. So uh, a while back, we, um, uh, a friend and I, I will not disclose his identity, uh, we did something really evil. We forked a branch of cock and we tried to add uh, a proof irrelevant, definitionally proof irrelevant notion of, of uh, prop, um, you know, proposition and, and propositional equality. And we find the single hardest thing uh, when we just wanted to say, yes, these things are proofs, so of course they're equal, was knowing what the types were of the things that we were kept, um, 
uh, comparing for equality. Uh, so uh, in epigram two, that wasn't even an issue because uh, we did um, uh, we did because uh, everything is type directed. The bidirectional approach means that you don't even ever try and make sense of canonical values unless you have a canonical type that they live in. So in particular. Uh, when you're comparing proofs for equality, uh, you know that they're proofs from their types. And it's especially easy if you make your universe of propositions a Tarski style universe of propositions. So we really did have this thing where if, uh, if, uh, uh, if you want to check that, um, uh, proof P is a type, then you should check that prop accepts P. Um, and, uh, you know, so the fact that our type of proofs begins uh, with, um, uh, with the canonical constructor proof, that's enough to tell you that you're done to, uh, comparing these things for equalities. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the use of Tarski style universes so that the types tell you clearly what's going on is, uh, is crucial. Okay, uh, I'm you know, running out of time and I'm halfway down the order of service. Let me go back to my computer for a moment, share screen again. Um, and uh, what do I want to do? I want to go back to my Emacs and I'm gonna kill that. Um, don't keep the buffer. Back to the top, meta x open pig. And then I want to fill in uh, that data type declaration. And then if I'm lucky, uh, I can show you what's actually generated uh, when you, as it were, declare the natural numbers. Um, as that's the other crucial thing about uh, Epigram 2's type theory. It is closed. It has only definitional extension, and that makes it extremely straightforward uh, to uh, work with. There's nothing generative ever. Um, and uh, what do we have? Uh, that we're really, when you write a, a data type declaration, it elaborates to a data type definition. What is being constructed is a code, a lump of data. So here's a, the list of constructor tags. And then here, for each constructor tag, uh, well, we have a list which for each constructor tag explains the data stored by that constructor. So uh, zero has an empty record of stuff, and um, uh, the, um, uh, the successor uh, has uh, uh, an, uh, the identity paired with an empty record, just so that everything's uh, right nested and, and null terminated. Uh, and that code is a lump of data, uh, and it's plugged into uh, wherever it's hiding. Uh, uh, let me see if I can find where it got to. Uh, the actual definition of the thing itself is uh, is somewhere. Um, ha <laughs> It's actually folded. It's folded away. You can't see it. But this is um, uh, so. There's a, a data type desk. Let me uh, um, uh, let me just. Well, maybe I can say infer desk. That's a set. Uh, that's the type of data type descriptions, uh, and 
uh, again, it gives rise to a Tarski style universe. There's a fixed point operator, mu, which takes a description of a functor, that's a lump of data that, de that determines a functor, uh, and gives you uh, the data type thus described. And the fun thing, of course, is that uh, the type of descriptions is itself a data type and has a description. So uh, all, of, uh, all of these constructor things, they're ordinary, they're the same sort of stuff. They're just tags in a, a data type. Let me just go find. Um, it's, it's on here somewhere. Right. Uh, actually, here defined in the um, uh, in the source code is the hardwired um, description of the type of descriptions. Um, the crucial thing, the reason, the way it works, it, it sounds like it must be cheating, and of course it is. Um, I mean, it, it's a, uh, it's a version of the Indian rope trick, you know, where you throw the rope up and then you climb up the rope and then you pull the rope after you. Um, and uh, uh, the trick is that the operators which interpret descriptions are hardwired. Um, and, and that's enough uh, to, to get away with the apparent circularity. Um, uh, okay, uh, so let me uh, let me talk a bit more about proof irrelevance because I think that's uh, that's interesting and, and surprising perhaps. And maybe I will even uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll switch. Back. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I couldn't find the hand raising button. It must be somewhere. But yeah, sure. By the way, good to see you. Anyway. Um, but my question is, uh, this descriptions, can you do inductive, inductive types? Uh, well, not in that particular universe, but so e exactly uh, one of the things about uh, this way of doing stuff is uh, that uh, the, um, uh, the, the design of what's a nice universe to use for such a closed type theory keeps improving. We've learned so much since since those dates, the universe that was implemented then is not the universe I would implement now. Okay. Um, the other thing, of course, I can say is that when you have proof irrelevance, you can do inductive inductive types by the old trick of, uh, first of all, defining preterms mm -hmm. as one not dependent bunch of uh, inductive data types, uh, you know, mutu but they're mutually defined. Uh, uh, but they, yeah, they don't have stepwise dependency on each other. And then you mutually define a bunch of goodness proofs. You know, what, what, is, what is it to say that they're well-formed? And the reason why that encoding doesn't normally work is that you have too many goodness proofs. But if you're proof relevant, uh, then uh, you get exactly inductive inductive definitions. But there is another problem with uh, deriving the eliminator uh, because you need a, a recursive recursive function to define the eliminator. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what it's happened. In Fred's, it's in Fred's PhD. So there right. is an issue, but it can be resolved, but it's a bit, yeah. uh, there's a longer story there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, for, so certainly I remember in the past getting bitten by absence of proof irrelevance mm -hmm. defining the eliminator. Uh, yeah. But the, the joy of proof of relevance is that that shit goes away. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't make everything go away, but it yeah. makes some things uh, go away. So I wanted to talk about proof of relevance, and I want to make my usual remark about irrelevance, which is adapted from teaching first year undergraduates about two's complement notation or two's complement representation. Uh, I'm always very careful to say there is no such thing as two's complement representation of signed numbers. There is only such a thing as n bit two's complement representation. And you need to know what n is, or you can't interpret, um, you can't interpret what's in front of you. Uh, and it's the same thing when people talk about irrelevance, 
They often talk about it rather casually without explaining to what the irrelevant stuff is irrelevant. And there is a whole bunch of subtle distinctions to make uh, where things which are irrelevant for one sort of activity are very, very relevant indeed for other sorts of activity. And you just have to be absolutely on the ball of what kind of irrelevance you care about, because that's very relevant. Um, so um, uh, what uh, I want to be clear about is that I want proofs to be irrelevant uh, for definitional equality testing uh, when we are type checking open terms. And there is no magic. The only way in which you can afford to consider all proofs of the same proposition to be equal is if you treat them all equally. It's important, you know, if you're not going to know, you better make sure you don't care. Um, so what you end up with is uh, what I call the, the demon of, of Socrates. Um, you know, Socrates, in, in his apology, I told you there'd be an apology, um, uh, in his defense speech at his trial, uh, when you know, his defense against the charge of atheism was that they had often heard him speak about hearing the divine voice. And he couldn't possibly be an atheist if he hears divine voices. And what's important about this divine voice is that it never tells Socrates what to do. It only tells him not to do bad stuff that he was thinking of doing. And that cashes out in epigram two by ensuring that the only practical way in which proofs of propositions eliminate over set valued computations is absurdity elimination. So the, you know, all that ever happens, the only way in which having a proof of something interferes with the computation is to say, I've got this proof, so I don't have to do that computation. And um, uh, when you play that game, uh, you can afford to be proof irrelevant. Um, because you exactly, you don't care which proof of absurdity turned up. Uh, you just, you know, the, the moment a proof of absurdity turns up, you can down tools. Um, and uh, so it might look like there's another one. It might look like the transportation of values between equal types is the interference of prop into set valued computation. Uh, but that's not how it actually goes. The way uh, coercion between provably equal types works is by looking at the types. And uh, if you, so you need a proof that the types are equal, you look at the types. If their head constructors are compatible, then you know how to do, how to transport the outermost constructor of the value. And if their uh, head constructors are not compatible, then you have a proof of absurdity and you can stop. So that's, how, that's a crucial thing. You've got to understand that if you want to do this apparently weird thing, if you don't have the equality reflection rule, then Martin Leff's old fashioned way of computing with equality proofs, right, what's that? It's wait until the two thing, the two types, if you're coercion between equal types, you wait till the types become definitionally equal. And then you do nothing. That's old fashioned Martin Leff equality computation. Wait for definite, you know, wait for reflexivity and then become the identity. And that inevitably nails propositional equality to the disappointing accident that is definitional equality. 
right? And it, it call, you know, equality reflection is a perfectly respectable way of saying, well, we don't want that disappointing accident, so we are going to nail definitional equality to propositional equality and, uh, and, and give up type checking. Um, that's a perfectly respectable strategy. Uh, but uh, what Torsten taught us to do and what we refined in, uh, in Epigram 2 was uh, to take the, the hard road of explaining if we're not going to compute with equality proofs in the Martin Leff, wait for reflexivity and then do nothing style, what are we going to do instead? And that's where this, um, if you have uh, you know, head compatibility of types, you can do head transportation of values uh, thing, gives you just enough to get canonicity. And uh, uh, so it's still making use only of, of really, the, so propositions are really the negative fragment of the logic. I mean, it's really, what are the propositions? Uh, false, true, conjunction, and universal quantification over sets. Uh, so exactly, uh, you know, what you'd expect. And then uh, equality is constructed by recursion over types in terms of those things. Uh, and, uh, and it all worked slowly, and we were able to um, uh, to you know, put stuff together. So um, uh, I guess I should try and wind up. Um, uh, and uh, you know, what what are the kind of takeaway things that that could still could still happen? Um, so. Um, uh, there's, uh, so certainly I would like to see first class data types be, you know, that's the thing that never happened anywhere else. I mean, if that was, if somebody on Twitter yesterday was saying, oh, I suppose this is just for historical interest and that all of this stuff has been absorbed by cock and acta and all of that sort of thing. Has it, bloody hell, uh, no, it hasn't, uh, you know, all, <laughs> all of this, uh, uh, machinery uh, is left, you know, rusting, half finished, underexploited, um, and uh, I, I really like to to get back there. Uh, I mean, the thing that so it's also one of those things where often for a good idea to be useful, several other good ideas have to come along in the meantime. So the thing about first class data type descriptions is that you can't get any kind of sensible performance out of them without staging. So we need uh, to improve modal type theory in order to make those ideas not merely good, but actually useful. Um, similarly, I would really like well, okay, it's one thing that I like about, I mean, cubicle type theory does such a good job of cleaning up observational type theory. It, you know, it's, uh, it would be nice to sort of revisit that uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and cook it that way. I mean, it's nice to see that you can build a cubicle type theory which is agnostic as to whether you are going to push it towards uniqueness of identity proofs and other even more aggressive notions of proof irrelevance or push it uh, towards univalence and other more aggressive forms of proof relevance. Uh, you know, the cubicle idea uh, is, is just brilliant uh, in, in both settings. And I, I really like to see a situation where maybe when we're doing stuff on the sphere, as it were, uh, when we're in settings where we know that, uh, that uh, all notions of equality are, are purely structural, uh, that we could get back a bit of, uh, a bit of definitional proof of relevance for those things. So that's the problem, is that Epigram 2 wasn't real for you lot. Uh, but it was real for me, so I feel like I've lost stuff when this stuff isn't available, whereas you never had it, 
and for that I genuinely do apologize there's also you know why uh, uh, you know why I have sometimes experienced uh, regret at things which look like progress um, uh, so yeah and the other thing I'd like just to mention is that we were beginning just beginning to get over the idea that computation with open terms is done no better than computation with closed terms. So the idea that if you have free variables, then you end up with neutral terms that cause computation to get stuck, just yielding bigger neutral terms um, you know that you know all, all that all that happens is that stuff gets stuck um, we were beginning to get past that and saying well you know why should the spines of eliminators that accumulate on free variables that make up neutral terms why should those be a free structure there's no good reason why we can't at the least sort of standardize uh, the forms in which things get stuck so that, for example, append is associative. Um, and uh, we were just uh, beginning to do that. So I guess I would, uh, I would make an appeal to actually, uh, and I, I think, you know, two level type theories are, are, are beginning to do this, uh, to think more clearly about uh, theorem proving as a, as a discipline of problem solving. And what's important to be able to do in your system is to have a language of the problems that are up for solution. And it's clear now in higher dimensional type theories that a problem is not necessarily just finding an inhabitant for a type. It's finding an inhabitant for a type which satisfies some intentional properties, like things, paths connect up appropriately. Um, and, you know, it, it's a bit like um, uh, what's been missing so far in type theory is the equivalent of the phrase such that the diagram commutes. One should be able to specify um, uh, and to do, you know, interactive problem solving that um, uh, where the problems specify all sorts of additional intentional conditions, uh, because we intend to have a richer, uh, a richer theory in the um, uh, uh, in the definitional equality. I mean, that's when you take definitional equality seriously as as a way to hand work off to a computer and be rid of it, uh, then uh, thinking about how to do better than just pattern match or get stuck is, is absolutely crucial. And it's in particular crucial if we're going to build um, proof assistance that really talk about structure rather than just stuff. So as a kind of bunch of early ingredients towards that ongoing endeavor, I'm really glad that Epigram 2 was a thing once and twice and multiple times. The joke was always that every time you mention it, you should increment the number. Um, uh, why was it never finished? Because it was restarted so many times. Because there was such uh, an exciting kind of ferment of, of foundational innovation that if you, if, you stop, uh, if you stop hacking for six months, as used to happen, you know, when, when we would restart again, we wouldn't want to implement that type theory anymore because foundational ideas would have come along in the meantime. And, uh, you know, so um, whilst 
it is important to uh, actually produce a system for people to use from time to time. I'm, uh, uh, I'm always worried when discussions in our community push towards uh, foundational stagnation as you know, the basis for building the great empire of formalized mathematics. Um, I, I think uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's fun to be had, there's creative, there's creative stuff to do, uh, you know, shoving the foundations over once in a while and thinking more in a principled way about what you would rather do. Uh, so, uh, I guess that makes me a terrible Trotskyist um, and ultimately achieve very little. But, uh, you know, um, and I, sorry. Well, all I can do is apologize to everyone who had to put up with me, um, knocking, knock, knocking it over every six months <laughs> uh, and, uh, and say, well, you know, we learned a lot. And lots of the bits and pieces, not least the underlying Haskell jiggery pokery, uh, has ended up making it out into the world anyway. So, yes, I think um, I can be at least a little bit pleased with the daisies that got pushed up by Epigram 2. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if there's a good way to clap here, but we can try. <laughs> Questions. If you have a question, just speak up. I think that's, that's worked well in the past. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, well, first, uh, let me thank you for the, the excellent talk. It's, uh, it's very inspirational to see this, uh, hear about all these things that uh, were done before I started my career in type theory. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I first have a, a remark that uh, proof irrelevance is uh, actually starting, I mean, you, you, uh, it, it is available nowadays in both uh, Koch and Agda. So in Koch you have this uh, universe S prop of uh, strict propositions, and where uh, Gaetan Gilbert, he solved most of the problems, I guess, that you talked about. Indeed, that the, the fact that the types are not there. And uh, in Agda also, we have a prop universe, which is uh, definitionally proof relevant that you can use. So uh, th those ideas have not been forgotten. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the, the question that I had was about the, so you do a data type encodings in Epigram. So I, I wondered whether you have some way to uh, to prevent two types from being accidentally equal. So uh, if, if two different data types happen to have the same code, but for some accidental reason, uh, how do you know, how, how would uh, distillation display them as the right one, for example? Uh, well, if you want to, um if you're being completely closed, then if you want to prevent accidental uh, collision, uh, then uh, the inevitable strategy is to introduce a gratuitous uh, index um, whose only role is to be a source of uh, generativity. Um, so, uh, uh, you, uh, you essentially index over the version number of the type and then you have, then you can right. tell different versions apart or you can abstract over all versions. Right, right. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And indeed, there might well be, uh, some motivation, uh, for exactly um, supporting uh, constructed generativity in, in the surface language. It is very often the case that you exactly want the surface language to look as if you're doing these things generatively. Yeah. You know, 
99% of the time, or rather, uh, you know, users, mm -hmm. uh, uh, users want to define their own single use type, but the people who are doing the generic programming to support library constructions uh, want to be able to see behind that. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, deriving instances and such. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? Could you? Yeah, I've got one. Um, could you think of meta variables not as some sort of uh, distant in the cloud thing, but um, rather a statement of inequality? So whenever you declare a meta variable, you say this thing is never going to be equal to anything else except itself. Um, in which case, whenever you, you sort of refine that type further such that it does become apparent that it is equal to other things, you disprove your proof of inequality. Um, and therefore, you could probably use the same meta variable as the index to two types to make sure that they always stay apart. Um. I think there's a different things going on here with um, uh, uh, meta variables, uh, which sort of live in some world of um, uh, 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 monotonic um, uh, uh, monotonic sort of meta development of, of you know, kind of concrete terms versus what you uh, what you need to do to make sure that uh, types even if they're already completed even if they're not if there are no holes in them are still recognizably different when you need them to be different um, so but I, I can certainly imagine that uh, as part of the process of uh, refining meta variables I mean it comes back to being able to um, specify uh, intentional properties you know, in problems to be solved that are not just find an inhabitant of this type but are you know find an inhabitant of this type which satisfies these equations you could certainly have find an inhabitant of this type which satisfies these apartnesses uh, so it, it's, it's certainly worth thinking about uh, what the language of problems is beyond problems as type and habitation. Yeah, um, a question uh, about the implications of first class data type definitions. What happens when a data type definition goes out of scope? Are definitions forever? Definitions are forever. Um, that was actually one of the amusing things uh, about the way the, the proof state worked, uh, being a, um, a, a tree-like structure uh, full of um, parameters, sort of abstracted variables. You can think of them as, as morally lambda bound. Uh, and uh, uh, meta variables, which are morally let bound, uh, even though um, uh, they, um, uh, uh, even though they might not have their, they might not be fully defined yet. They're they're basically lets in waiting, uh, and and they actually scoped rather differently in the proof state. So the parameters, the lambda bound variables, just scope further down their branch of the tree. Whereas the lets scoped in order everywhere in the tree after them. Not, in, not necessarily just in their own branch. Uh, and so that's sort of crucial, uh, crucial definition to how uh, those things work. Um, and uh, you know, it does of course create an interesting issue as a, a classic issue that we've had in uh, dependently typed language uh, languages all the way along, uh, which is kind of um, the pervasiveness of definitions and what happens about definitions in 
uh, module boundaries and all of that uh, classic stuff. And that's one reason why observational equality is extremely useful um, because you can say, uh, here's a module signature uh, and we expect to receive, you know, something of this type and what's more, we even give it a reference implementation, which can be treated as holding, um, holding definitionally for purposes of um, uh, building on top of that module. Um, and then it turns out that the actual implementation that you want to plug in does not satisfy those equations definitionally. Are you screwed? No, you're not. Because you can prove that the definition you're plugging in is equal to the reference implementation. All right, I have a question. Um, what are, so I definitely uh, like the idea of trying to mix uh, first, class type descriptions, first class type descriptions, uh, staging, and computing with open terms, aka symbolic computation. Um, what are we missing to, to actually make these mesh? Um, hmm. uh, so, What's missing? That certainly, uh, the appropriate notions of of staging um, haven't quite um, shown up yet. Uh, but I think they're heading that way. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff being done on modal type theories, um, where uh, you can really uh, guarantee that you know if you figured out what that data type description was at, at an earlier stage then you can have the specialized version of its computation rules and, um, and, and what have you um, the there's something really interesting to think through when it comes to more interesting uh, definitional equality uh, there's uh, where so I'm at the stage where I know several instances of the trick that Pierre Boutillier, Guillaume Allais, and uh, and myself uh, worked through. But what I don't really know is what the general recipe is, um, and. Uh, and I'm enjoying watching uh, Ohad Kamar's work on uh, free extensions uh, of, of theories, uh, something that's sort of heading in the direction of, um, you know, what would it be to, uh, to explain that uh, such and such an equational theory is sufficiently tractable uh, to be handed off to the definition of equality. Um, but that's, that's what's, what's that recipe? I think that's a really interesting problem that uh, 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 I would love people to work on. I would work on it with them if I had time and energy, but I know I can't solve it myself. Uh, until I retire, maybe I'll just retire. That would be nice. Quickly, Let's repeat master. another question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question or a comment for um, Connor. Thanks very Generally, much for when that. A question or a comment, it's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to agree and disagree. <laughs> so at the end, you were um, lamenting a bit that you had so many creative ideas that never turned into a fixed system that you could distribute. And I wanted to both um, praise and condemn that. You know, it's fantastic having so many great ideas. You have a huge body of published work that's amazing. But then we look at one piece, you have a huge body of equally amazing work that's not published. And um, I, I guess I just want to say for the rest of the world, please publish it, right? Stuff doesn't exist until it's published. Our job is to help the world move, not just have good ideas, but to help the world move forward. And that can only happen 
when it's published. So, you know, it's amazing you had all these great ideas. It's amazing that you kept coming up with even better ideas. So you didn't want to finish the last one. But it really is important to balance these two things, right? If there's a question here, it's how does one go about balancing it? I just wanted to make the case for getting it out and published as well as doing the great ideas. No, I, 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 I miss not being able to read about some of the other great things you did. I, I, uh, I would love to have published more than I have. Um, but um, the, the, whole, uh, the whole business of uh, uh, you know, the, the competing things that one is obliged to do. Um, I mean, it's not just overwork uh, uh, and, you know, being a, being a teacher and, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, it's, um, uh, it, it is also just being easily nerd sniped by the next shiny thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I certainly will absolutely <laughs> confess to that. Uh, uh, so it's why I also try and live in a kind of uh, slightly public space uh, where uh, if I'm working on something, I certainly don't hide it. I certainly tell people I'm working on it and leave piles of code and scribbled half papers all over GitHub and um, just sort of uh, generally try to be someone who's conspicuously thinking about stuff and thinking about conspicuous stuff. Uh, you know, rather than, uh, you, know, you know, desperately hoping that some people will come along and take some of it away, right? I mean, you know, my approach to car security has always been to leave the, <laughs> the, the window wound down and the keys in the ignition and sort of, you know, stand on the other side of the street pointing at the fucking thing. And, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you know would, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess another thing that, that happens is um, that uh, the structure of PhDs is that uh, a PhD student has to eventually deliver a thesis about a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, what would happen is that uh, a, um, a a new bunch of PhD students would come along and they'd need to learn everything from the start, which often means start again. And then when we're kind of part of the way through the development process, uh, they realize that they are not going to get a thesis out the door anything like on time if they just stay hacking all the time. Uh, so it stops and the cycle renews itself. Uh, I got a great deal of admiration for Edwin bringing Idris into existence uh, and he managed to get it off the ground enough that he was able to get his PhD students to work on an aspect of something within Idris as a going concern uh, but to get the whole thing built from nothing using uh using phd student labor is is pretty difficult unless you have you know oof as your phd student <laughs> uh, and he's doing a swedish phd of course where you have much more time sorry we have a bunch of people with their hands raised so jesper you have another question so let's try to get some of these questions through a little more quickly because we are already yeah. running, running pretty late. So Phil just asked a question. So I'm gonna assume that means lower hand. Um, yep. Next, next person who wants to ask a question. Um, somebody speak up. Yes, I, uh, I, yeah. I have a question. I've got a question. Okay, so Sorry. Philip, can you go second? 
Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, you spoke about about humans and machines and, and, and the role uh, uh, when when a human has to prove something with a proof assistant with with a machine. Um, uh, is I mean, I, I sometimes I use Agda for example. I sometimes I have the feeling that uh, the machine is doing some things that I should do, and, and maybe that I do something that some things that the machine should do also. I mean, do you have clear? Uh, which things should the machine do and which things should the the, the human do? Uh, it, it's never completely clear-cut, but I think it works really well when uh, a human characterizes a well-circumscribed theory and proves that that theory is decidable. You know, at that point, it's it's clear that the humans have disposed of that kind of task. Uh, I mean, you know, rather than just sort of doing um, search bounded by some natural number index that you provide <laughs> or, or something like that. I think it's nice when it's, when you've got a, a completeness and a decidability result for a particular theory. Uh, that's good taste. But of course, one can do these things in bad taste. You're quite right. <laughs> Thank you. Philip? Yeah. Um, so I would just like to circle back to what you said earlier about representing more of the intentional problems in proof assistance and making them available to users. So in my work on general type theories and, and Andromeda, um, what I found is that really traditional proof assistants are mostly concerned with constructing inhabitants of types. And the other judgment forms are not taken very seriously. So already at that level, there's a lot more to be done, I think. But um, you said that maybe two level type theories could be one way to approach this kind of problem. I was wondering if you had other thoughts on what sorts of problems typically we should phrase for proof assistance and whether we should phrase them in type theory, possibly two level type theory. Uh. I think that well, the ones which occur to me most naturally are uh, showing that categorical structure is present by design. So instead of saying, uh, you know, treating an indexed data type as a functor from dis some uh, discrete category to set. Actually, you know, this is a good, here's a good question to think about. Um, uh, how do I construct inductively a data structure which is non-trivially appreciative? So, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, that, so that the actual that the structure that the indexing category has structure and that that structure is being respected. Uh, you know, I, and similarly, it would be great to actually be able to work in uh, in, in slice categories. You know, to be able to say, well, um, uh, we have uh, we have some functional interpretation of the data in this type. Uh, and uh, and that has to be respected on the nodes by morphisms. Uh, I think there's sort of lots of opportunities for using uh, an enhanced notion of uh, of problem to really talk about structure in principled ways. That's what I was trying to say with the distinction between between structure and just stuff. Right. So all of those can be stated readily already in the language of type theory, if I understand correctly. Well, so the question is, um, uh, how much can you, uh, how much can you get, first of all, by design, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I shouldn't, I get fed up proving that uh, syntax with binding 
uh, respects renaming. It's obvious that it respects renaming mm -hmm. when you're aware of the renaming structure of the sets of variables over which you construct the terms. That's, uh, you know, it, <laughs> so it's just uh, a nuisance to have to do those proofs uh, when it's the deliberate consequence of a design choice. Uh, and then even better is the fact that uh, the equational theory of the category of renamings is decidable. So why shouldn't a machine decide it? So there's sort of two levels. One is like doing stuff to you know, deliberately inducing structure. And the other aspect is deliberately dividing labor between, uh, between humans and machines and saying, you know, this is, uh, this is completely work for my dog, not for me. Right. And, and do you think that two level type theory is the hammer that fits this nail? Uh, I'm not sure it is, but it's certainly got aspects. I mean, I'm, I'm mentioning it because it's got aspects yeah. of um, not just talking about type inhabitation, but talking about other intentional properties yeah. as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. We have, let's try, we have three more questions. Let's hope they don't, they're not going to be terribly long. So, Casper? Uh, I'll try to keep it short. Perhaps this is somewhat connected it's to what you were... The answers I'm worried about. The answers that are the problem. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so thanks for the very inspirational talk and for all the inspirational work. Um, my question is about uh, your the picture that you were drawing, where you uh, drew uh, your type checker and then elaboration. You had a programming language up there, and you said, this is the thing that we want to write, and you showed us Cochon. So what is the programming language that you said you never got around to implementing it. Um, so for that, um, so certainly the, we, we got somewhere with, uh, I was trying to make those, um, uh, my tactic scripts look as much like programs as possible. Um, but the, so the spirit of epigram uh, from the, uh, from James McKenna really, I mean, you know, epigram one would, uh, which really was a thing, folks. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, which it came into existence, thankfully, because of there was no foundational reconsideration. It was just the type theory that we already knew, dressed up as a programming language. Uh, but uh, the the point of epigram style programming is that it's done as a dialogue. You record the dialogue of problem solving. So it's always. Left hand sides are problem presentations and right hand sides are human deciding, making a choice that allows progress to be made. Um, so they're inherently tree structured rather than linear uh, and, um, I, I, and they're a, rec a recording of the problem solving dialogue. Uh, in the case of um, functional programming, problems look a lot like left-hand sides. Uh, in the case of theorem proving, uh, I think problems should, the more useful information is what's, what the sub-goal is, what's being proven, not a kind of left-hand side that stands for a putative proof. I think also proof irrelevance makes that uh, kind of compelling. Um, so I actually don't want to write, you know, plus a soak x, y, z equals something or other. I want to explain why this equation holds. <laughs> so uh, so it, was, it was always going to be an interesting design question about how do you present the problem you're trying to solve? Um, uh, and there was also lots of fun to be had just thinking about, given that data type construction is now a matter of definition rather than declaration. Uh, and that the bidirectional approach makes it clear that, for example, the indices of a data type, they are information that you already have available when you're deciding, for example, what constructors are going to be available. Uh, so the idea that you might actually really compute with uh, uh, the, uh, the indices when deciding what's in your data type. 
I mean, why not? It's great. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it was, uh, I, I, I certainly saw that Bob was here. Bob Harper was, was here earlier. This is um, a classic instance where I get angry in the opposite way that he does. Uh, <laughs> uh, when, uh, when people, um, uh, when people see, when, when the syntax of your programming language just gives you a, a kind of variable binding and you can really do honest to God computation. Uh, <laughs> When uh, you know it's the same problem, weak function spaces and strong function spaces not being properly distinguished. Uh, but I think our syntax of data type declarations gives us a weak function space where a strong function space is perfectly sensible. <laughs> uh, so there's a whole bunch of design choices like that that we never really got around to, although we did have some thoughts about them. Uh, Pierre wrote some great papers about uh, elaborating data type declarations, um, and uh, uh, yeah. There were, yeah, so many things that never happened. <laughs> okay, can we go to the next question? David? In your presentation of observational type theory and also in the sort of some of the cubicle reconstructions I've seen like XTT, it's fundament, it's presented as being kind of fundamentally about recursion on the universe. So you have like your closed universe of types and that's how you get the meaning of your equality proposition. Um, and yet, on the other hand, Bob Ackie's got this uh, implementation of observational type theory, which takes advantage of the fact that proof irrelevance gives you axiomatic freedom. You know, you can postulate any true thing without gumming up the computational works. Right. And, and his implementation doesn't define equality by recursion on the universe, but instead by sort of giving you um, essentially postulates that say what it means for things to be equal. Do you have any uh, thoughts on sort of the practical implications of these approaches or sort of subtle things that people who aren't sort of marinated in these things for long periods of time might need to learn from? Right, so um, uh, one thing to say about proof of relevance is that exactly, uh, you know, if you do this Socratic thing where, you know, uh, you're only ever really doing ex falso quad event, right? Absurdity elimination. Then you can indeed uh, just postulate whatever axioms you like, uh, as long as you have the good taste only to like axioms which are consistent. And uh, so you could indeed just present the entire thing as a kind of manually constructed type directed axiomatization of the rules of equality, and that would totally work. Um, it's um, actually quite nice just to get a bit of computation out of it. Uh, you know, I always, um, uh, I, I always like the way um, uh, that, uh, you know, when you compute equality structurally, you know, it begins to, it's like the, the, uh, it's the boring rigid rigid cases of the unification algorithm that are just being handed to you. Right, you know, it's really nice not to have to bother saying, "Oh, but that constructor is injective." <laughs> um, and and this does sort of imply that every that all of them are injective, right? Um, well, uh, if you're uh, uh, in the sense that. Um, uh, Tags are different, and uh, and that pairing is pairing. I mean, okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, if there's nothing going on other than uh, now what's structural. I mean, I, I hasten to add that although we didn't have, uh, you know, we, although we were determined to be proof relevant, we did have quotients where essentially you could plug in uh, the equivalence relation of your choice. Um, and 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 you know and, and show that you respected it. So, uh, uh, the, the 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 two approaches are certainly not in conflict. Uh, I, I think it's just fun to get the computer to do work uh, when uh, when it's perfectly possible, right? Yeah, it is something I inherited from my father. It was actually just watching computers do work that I'm not doing. I, I find that Im immensely pleasurable. Thanks.
Andre, okay, please. so 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 my question would be: uh, did, did you have any exotic data types? So did you have like descriptors that didn't or or maybe didn't initially correspond to data types? that you could write in the surface syntax? Did, did you have the opportunity to discover data types? Uh, so, oh yes, frankly, um, uh, in that uh, the sort of surface syntax of data declarations uh, didn't allow you to compute like constructors which take variable numbers of recursive substructures. Um, but that is perfectly possible when you compute descriptions. I mean, that's the whole point. You, you have the full power of a programming language, not just a variable binding construct. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, underexploited fun. And figuring out what the surface notation ought to be that allows us uh, to exploit those extra possibilities. That, that's, a, that's a good project. Okay, thanks. Andres, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's wrap up. Uh, thanks, Connor, very much for giving this talk. And I hope to see you all, or at least some, uh, in our next seminar. And I don't recall whether it's two weeks from now or one week from now, but it'll be, it'll be announced. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thank you. What happened? <laughs> Thanks, Connor. Bye bye.